Mule was designed by Danny Bunton and published in 1983 for the Atari and Commodore computers by a cocky upstart software company named Electronic Arts. A few years later, a Nintendo version was published, but as far as I know, there have been no official re-releases for it since then. And that's a shame, because it's a great multiplayer game that still holds up today murky 8-bit graphics and all. Mule is essentially a board game, and a concrete simulation of a tiny, self-contained supply and demand economy on an alien world. Each of the four players is an interplanetary colonist, trying to turn a profit by mining the planet Irata. Yeah, you see what they did there. Errata for a valuable mineral called Smithor. The standard game takes place over 12 turns, the winner being the one who built up the most wealth when the time runs out. As the game progresses, each player acquires plots of land surrounding a little city, and then decides on each turn how to best exploit that land. The ultimate goal is to extract as much Smithor as you can, but in order to do that successfully, you have to support your operations by having access to enough food to feed your workers and energy to power your machines. You can make this food and energy yourself by dedicating some of your land to their production, or you can trade with other players for them. Early in the game, while there's still plenty of vacant plots on the screen, the game literally gives away land through land grants. It moves a cursor across each of the empty plots, handing it over to the first player who hits their joystick button, with one per customer. After that, there's sometimes an auction phase for additional plots, where players use Mule's most excellent auction interface to try to outbid each other. Uh, you name your price by using your joystick to push your little dude up and down. So if you're a big meanie, and you should be, even if you don't want to buy the land, you can force your opponent, who is desperate to have it, to pay more by driving the price way up and then backing down at the last second. That's great, I love that. Never let anyone buy land for cheap. Phase two is called the exploitation phase. Going in order from richest to poorest, each player gets a chance to run around the map, configuring their land to produce various things. You do this by purchasing a mule in the town, that's supposed to be a ornery robotic work animal, and outfitting it for either mining, farming, or energy production. You then lead it over to a plot of land and install it there. There are three terrain types, each good with a certain kind of production. Mining works best in the mountains, for example, while farming is best done in the river, uh, that's that brownish thing running down the middle of the map. However, you can boost production anywhere by having two neighboring plots doing the same thing, and over time, your plots will get better at whatever it is they're doing. Random events often occur prior to each player's turn, represented by scrolling text messages informing them of some boon or disaster that just befell them. The game uses what we game wonks call negative feedback. The players in the lead tend to get rotten random events that result in the loss of money, resources, or even land. Players lagging behind usually have good things happen. Not enough to upset the balance, just enough to keep everyone in the running and having fun. After everyone goes, there's a production phase where all the plots sprout happy little dots representing fresh resources. And then there's a chance of more random events, this time which can affect everyone. Uh, sunspots might boost energy production, while a pirate raid will result in everyone losing all the smith ore they just mined. There's also meteor strikes, and acid rain, and space locust attacks, and I don't know what all. Finally, there's an auction phase where players get a chance to buy and sell their resources, either trading with each other or making sales and purchases with the town store. Again, this interface is great. At the start of each auction, buyers align themselves at the bottom of the screen and walk up to represent what they're willing to pay. Sellers are at the top and walk down in order to lower their asking price. If two players manage to literally meet in the middle, a transaction takes place. If you're playing against humans, this is where you can have fun, taunting your friends by raising your asking price by a step every time they come towards you. As a friend of mine uh, noted, this is the economic version of taunting your little brother by rolling the car forward a foot every time he reaches for the door handle. More importantly, this is where you can try to influence the price of resources on future turns. If you're the only player producing energy, for example, and you choose not to sell any, then the brace price will go up due to scarcity. You can then make a killing parceling it out to energy desperate players in a future turn. You have to be careful about the shortages though. If there's a colony-wide smith ore shortage going on, then mules become more expensive, and if the colony is low on food or energy, then players' turns become shorter. Mule requires four players who all gather around the computer to play. This game predates network play, you see. The computer provides bots to fill in where needed, so it's possible to play with two or three people, or even solo. Playing this game on a modern computer requires an emulator, but that's not terribly difficult to come by. Uh, the footage you've been watching this whole time was from an Atari emulator running on my Macintosh. Uh, 
you can find links to some emulators as well as the game itself on this show's website, gameshelf.jmac.org. There is also a modern Mule-inspired shareware game for Windows called Space Horse, published by Gilly Games, and that offers a free demo. What are your feelings on this game, Joe? Uh, again, um, as you probably noted many, many times, the, the game holds up very well uh, 20 years later. It really does. Um, the game play, this, is, this comes from an era when gameplay trumped graphics, obviously, uh, and it was, uh, it's, it's quite fun. Mm -hmm. Recommend it uh, even even today. I understand you've been playing it a lot on a Nintendo emulator, actually. Lately. I, I have, uh, yeah. So so obviously, um, uh, Mule was ported to a bunch of different platforms, uh, and and essentially, as far as far as I can tell, the different platforms just added better graphics and fancier music. Right. They went all the way up from Atari 800 graphics yeah. to Nintendo Entertainment System graphics. Well, yeah. cool. did did the game survive that leap of uh, technology? <laughs> it did, except it's well. I mean, you get more fluffery and. Uh, Mule is a game. I think in the 8-bit, you know, the the, uh, the Atari 800 version, um, it is uh, it's a tight enough game. You've got 12 turns, so um, you know it's it's already sort of taxing. You know, it takes maybe 20 minutes to play with two players. Yeah, well, about a half an hour, I'd say. Oh, about a half an hour. So if you add fluffy graphics in there and sort of cute cutscenes, it just I don't know what that adds to the game. Oh, they put cutscenes in it? Uh, yeah, there's more. Wow, uh, that's yeah, cinematic. Sort of silly. Um, so yeah, it's uh, so. But but I. But again, the um, you know. So there's what's what's interesting about Mule is the the uh, the uh, arcade-like elements to it. Um, the fact that um, you you know the the, the plot um, gra the land grab section where mm -hmm. it really does depend on hitting your yeah. your, your trigger button fast right. enough um, is sort of irritating. To, you know, it's a little weak. I've I've missed out on the thing because I wanted the plot in like the lower right corner, but yes. the the cursor only moves in this pattern, and if you miss it, then you don't get anything. You get right. nothing. You get you get nothing. And um, uh, for those of us that are grew up on more turn-based games, that can be a little jarring. And and the whole, um, you know, you have a limited time to go and and outfit your mule and put them on the correct settlement, the little house on, mm -hmm. on your on your plot. And you know, if, if time is is ticking down, uh, it's hard enough to hit that. Uh, fairly large target of the house. Yeah, I mean, but you never actually really have a problem. So long, so long as you have enough food and energy, you don't really have a problem running out of time. Well, I know, so, so one of the games I was playing, I had three, three plots to, to mm -hmm. do at a turn, in, even though I was full up on food and energy. Well, um, you only have so long to, to, to tend your plots. So I, I, don't, I don't think that the time thing was so harsh, but the timing thing of the button pressing and making sure you're exactly in the right spot or, or the mule runs away, that's, that's a bit much. That, yeah. that wouldn't transfer so well to a modern electronic game. But again, the overall game, I mean, this is a nit, and, and I have to say, the, the, the sheer joy of getting back to, uh, to, to introducing um, these arcade elements is, is something I almost wish uh, modern games would take advantage of. Uh, in, in some strange way, I feel like modern games are a little bit too much like um, uh, desktop applications rather than arcade games. Mm -hmm. so. A little, a little, a little more Pac-Man, a little less Sid Meier Civilization. Uh, a little less Microsoft Word, yeah. Uh, or, or that. Yes. Fair enough. Yeah.